Praise the Lord. Okay, so actually, Jeremy, it was Norma Street. Oh, Norma, right. so in, in down, or in Manitou Springs anyway. So, uh, and in fact, we had to, the men's room was a porta potty outside the school. Yeah, no joke. The ladies got to go where it was warm. But us men, we had to be out in the cold. So, um, yeah, so that was a lot of years ago. We were, I was actually, Leslie and I, we were the, I was the fourth graduating class of Karis Bible College. Back then it was called Colorado Bible College. So, um, like, like Jeremy said, I've done pretty much everything you can think of in the local church. Um, from I started now in 1999 when I graduated. Shortly after that, it's like the end of 99, early 2000. I opened up my the ministry, um, but really just you know I wasn't I wasn't getting any invites at all to be quite honest with you. I got a few here and there, so I just served at my local church and I just did anything. And you know if you serve God in in just with your whole heart, just wanting to be a blessing, God will promote you. And so, I mean, we, we came in and we were just happy to be part of the cleaning crew on Saturdays to come in and sweep the floor. And next thing you know, we're children's pastors. And then next thing you know, we're, 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 I'm the associate pastor. And then, you know, they don't have a worship leader for some Sundays. So it's like, hey, why don't you lead work? You know, God just begins to promote you and put you into different places. And there was a, there was a season of time. I got, I got some, there's a table back there. By the way, there's a, a, a product table back there, and everything on that table is free. We just ask, if, you know, if you do, if, if, you, if you feel on your heart to give, go ahead and do that. But um, a lot of that stuff is just years of experience, right, that I learned over the years. So when, I first, when we first moved to Pennsylvania, we, we bought a, a house, and I put a sound room down in my house, in the basement of my house. Um, and I got, on, I got a radio contract to be on radio in Washington, D.C. So I started to, to do radio in Washington, D.C. I built this soundproof room. And uh, at, I was telling the first service that at one point, my daughter was probably, oh, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years old, somewhere along in there. And she was battling fear. And so she'd be waking up in the middle of the night and come over to our room, or we would hear her sobbing in the other room because she was afraid, and you know, Leslie or I would get up, and what's wrong, honey? And she, she would be crying, I'm afraid. And so, you know, we'd pray with her, but you know, after night after night after night of this happening, and I'm like, you know, I gotta get some sleep here. I can't be up every night with a, with a young teenager because she's afraid. And so, um, so I went down into my sound booth, and I just read the scriptures dealing with fear just read them just with a very um, sooth, kind of a soothing voice. And then once I, once I had done that, then, and I did that on a computer, and then Leslie took her anointed talent and overlaid music to it. So now that I was reading these, the scriptures to combat fear, I had this really nice music playing in the background. And what I did with that CD is I put that in my daughter's CD player and put it on loop and just ran that all night long while she was sleeping. And I'm not kidding you, it was within two or three days, she was delivered from that spirit of fear. She would just, she would sleep through the night and really, you know, other than normal things of fear that we're tempted with, really hasn't had to deal with that so much. But that, that, that's that scripture. Anybody, that CD out there on that product table, that's it. Anybody, uh, <laughs> Audrey, you got it, girl. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so what, once I realized, man, that's powerful. Like, I need to do that with the healing scriptures. So I did, because, you know, we all battle. I don't, I don't care, you know, how perfected you are when it comes to understanding the word of God and fighting off sickness. But l listen, we all get attacked, right? And every one of us deals with, with, with an attack of sickness. You may not succumb to the battle, but at least you're going to have to fight it off. And, and the word of God is powerful. And there is no better way to fight off sickness than with the scriptures. And so the same thing. But I did it for me. I read the scriptures. Leslie put the music to it. 
And I would, like if I was feeling symptoms, I'd put it in my CD player next to my bed and I'd play that thing all night. Just put it on loop, play it all night long and then wake up with your healing in the morning. Who, who wants that? There, there's more of these out there. There's more of those out there. And then my last one I want to give away. Again, it's all for free out on the table. So as long as they're out there, uh, and just a quick note, we're actually, when I planted my church in 2012, um, I was the senior pastor there until 2019. Well, actually, it's the end of 2018. And I was wore out, to be honest with you. I was pastoring a church. I, had, I was the head of a construction company. It had three, two subsidiaries to it. And we did, uh, our primary part of it was hardwood flooring. And I had, you know, several crews that did that. But then I also built houses on the side. And I also did remodeling and flipped houses on the side. And then was a senior pastor of a church and of about this, you know, about 50 people or so on a typical Sunday. And I, I, was, um, I was just plumb getting wore out, right? And so um, I, I won't go into the details of it, but I had a bit of a health challenge. Not a, not a permanent thing. I just had some, had the heart. Well, I'll tell you the story since you're asking. <laughs> Because you'll, you'll need to understand this. So, Because this is really important when it comes to you not listening. You know, about a year earlier, the Lord talked to me about, about um, selling my, my business. But I didn't listen. I just, I was like, how am I going to make money? Because that was my prime, our primary source of income. How am I going to make money? And so um, I woke up one Sunday morning. This was the reason why I sold my business. I woke up one Sunday morning with chest pain that radiated down my left arm. And I had, and I was going to preach that morning, which I ended up did preach it. So um, I went down into my study uh, and had a really nice study, you know, a big room, had a lot, a couple of really nice chairs in there. And I just sat down in my typical chair and uh, just began to study the scriptures and get ready for my Sunday morning uh, teaching and just began to confess over my, my heart and, you know, for it to calm down. And I just, uh, just declaring the promises of God over myself and, you know, kept studying, prayed in tongues for, for, for a long time. I usually would get up, you know, two or three hours before the service uh, so I'd have time to study and be ready. And I wasn't getting better at all, just to be honest. And so I, I, got, I finished up with my study and I'm, I'm ready now for the Sunday morning service. And so I, I walked upstairs into our master bedroom and we have, we have a big club chair in our master bedroom uh, back then. You could sit in and read or whatever. Uh, and so I sat down in that, in that big, you know, soft chair. And Leslie would happen to be on the bed reading her Bible and drinking a cup of coffee. And I said, honey? She said, yeah. I said, I got something to tell you. She closed her Bible real slow, you know, set it off on the side of the bed. She said, what? And in my mind, honestly, when I went upstairs, I thought, you know what, I better tell her. Just in case I drop dead of a heart attack in the pulpit, she'll know why. <laughs> right? I mean, that was my thinking. So I said, honey, I got something. She says, what? I said, well, I'm having some issues. She said, what kind of issues? She, I said, well, I'm kind of. She said, you need to go to the hospital right now. I said, I'm not going to the hospital. I got to preach. How can I possibly go to the hospital when I got to teach? I don't have anybody standing in, in the pulpit. So, um, she says, no, you're going to the hospital. So we had a little bit of a, of a passionate discussion. And uh, she said, let me check your blood pressure. So she checked. She, she had a blood pressure cuff she got from her dad years ago. She put that on there. And my blood, I don't know what was it was, like 190-something over 180, 170-something. It was like whew, way up there. She said, you are going to the hospital. I said, I am not going to the hospital. I said, let me do this. Let me do this. I said, let me pray. Let me get in the shower. Let me ask the Lord. Whatever he tells me, I will do. I promise. She, you know, are you going to tell me the truth? That was the question, right? You're going to tell me the truth? I said, yes, honey, I promise you. I will tell you exactly what the Lord tells me to do. So I got in the shower and I was in there for just a few minutes. And the Lord specifically spoke to me and said, I want you to go have Tom and Carol pray for you. When you go to church, go to church, have Tom and Carol pray for you. So Tom and Carol was my chief elder and his wife. And they, they're, they're, they're Andrewites, Kenneth Copelandites, you know, Kenneth Haganites. They, they listened to all the faith teachers, right? 
So I, I, I went into church and I walked in and I told Leslie and she said, okay, but as soon as you get home, I'm taking your blood pressure again. If it's elevated, you're going to the hospital. I said, fair enough. So um, I get into church, walk in through the front doors, about 45 minutes before the service. Tom and Carol there said, Tom, hey, I need you to come see me before the service starts. I, I, I want to talk to you about something. He said, okay. So came in. I came in and just our, we were set up nearly identical to the church here. I sat in the front row just like Pastor Rick does. About two minutes before the service started, Tom and his wife slipped in behind me and said, what's up, Pastor John? So I told him the story. He says, well, let's pray. So he put his, him and his wife put their hands on me, and they, the word of God just tumbled out of, their, out of their mouth. I mean, it just flowed like rivers of living water. They quoted nearly every heel in Scripture over me, and, and I stood in agreement. I got up, man, I preached that. I shook the corn. But, yeah, man, I, I laid it down, man. I gave the meats, right? So, um, so after that, we came home, and Leslie, of course, said, we're checking your blood pressure. Well, my blood pressure was like 122 over 80-something. I mean, it was completely normal. Yeah, it was completely normal. But about a week later, I was like, yes, Lord, I'll sell. So I sold my business, and about two months later, I merged my church um, I merged my, and out of the prompting of the Lord, I met a pastor in town. We really hit it off. He had about the same size church. We merged our churches together. He had, he had been in ministry for probably 40 years or so as a pastor, 35, 40 years. I said, I said, pastor, you're going to be the, the senior. He said, no, 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 we'll be, we'll be both senior. I said, no, that's not the way it works. You're going to be the senior pastor. I'll be your associate. So I stepped back out of associate. Now, little did I know the Lord Within probably three months, four months, I got a call from Mike and Carrie Pickett asking if I would come to, if I would entertain a job here at the ministry, if I'd be willing. And so um, came out here and several times and had some talks with them. Leslie and I prayed about it. And next thing you know, I'm working for Andrew Womack Ministries, right? See how the Lord, though, isn't he amazing how he just, he, he begins to move the chess pieces around the board. And, and real quick, uh, I just, and then I'm going to get, because that, that'll launch me into my, into my message. But there's another one. This, I preached this at a local church uh, in a local assembly of God back in Pennsylvania about the benefits of communion. I mean, the covenant meal is amazing. We do it every time here. One of the things I like about this church, we take communion every Sunday. And I'm telling you, it is powerful, and you can receive healing from it. This is a, this is a, a how many minutes is this? This is like, I don't know, 46 minutes, but it just talks about the covenant meal and about communion. If anybody want this, okay. It's, it's pretty awesome. But here, here, let's talk about, now, my first, the first um, service this morning, I only got through, my, I have two pages of notes, and I only got through my first page of notes. So I'm jumping right into the meat. You guys missed the fluff. Sorry about that. You guys missed the fluff. But now I got the, I'm bringing you the meats. I, I, sit on the, I sit on the first service. One of the reasons I can't, Leslie and I, for six months, we, we church hopped until we, you know, just you go to a church, right? And you try to hear from the Lord, is this where we're supposed to go, Lord? And so we, and we just, we, we, we would spend two or three weeks in a church. No, nah, this isn't it. And finally we landed here. And one of the things that I so appreciate about Pastor Rick is it's like going to Arby's, right? We got the meats. <laughs> you get meat when you come here. And, and that's what I like. I, I'm a, I love the Word of God, and I love the power of the Word of God, and I love line upon line teaching. And that's what Pastor Rick brings to our table, you know, every week. So I feel privileged that I'm able to, to, to stand up here with you guys. I feel like I'm in the Hall of Fame right now, standing, you know, standing up here before you guys and able to preach to you. So um, one of the things, though, I want to talk about, we're, we're talking about, some, about spiritual warfare, really. And one of the most, I have a series out back there, is about hearing the voice of God. And one of the most important things as far as spiritual warfare is concerned and... and um, and being victorious in your, your walk as a Christian is being able to hear the voice of God. 
See, most, so I started thinking over the last 27 years of ministry, Pastor Rick contacted me about a month ago and he said, hey, will you fill in Sunday for me? I'm going to be going to Oklahoma to preach. And I said, oh, brother, I, it would be pastor. It'd be a, a blessing for me to do that. So I started thinking after he told me that, I started thinking, I have 27 years of ministry. What, could, what nuggets could I give to help you implement in your life that's going to make you successful? Because honestly, I don't know how we survived. I mean, other than the grace of God, my wife and I, through 27 years of ministry. Let me tell you something. You, you, you know, you're in a battle. We're in a battle as a Christian. You are in a battle. But pastors and ministers and leaders are in an even greater battle. Because if you can take down the leader, then you can, you can, take, down, you can take out a whole company of people, right? If you can take down the leader. So, I mean, Leslie and I, and we haven't done it perfectly. We, believe me, we haven't done it perfectly. But Leslie and I have endeavored to, 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 to take ground and to be victorious our entire life. Again, we haven't done it perfectly, but, but we're still standing. And, and we're still taking ground. Right? We're not just standing, but we're, take, we're standing and advancing the kingdom. And here's the deal. You are in a spiritual battle. You are in a, a battle whether you realize it or not and whether you want to admit it or not. And most Christians, they do not even think of taking ground. They're just happy. They're just happy to keep what they have and that the devil hasn't taken it away from them yet. Right? They're just happy to hold the ground. So they just, you know, a, a lot of Christians, I'd say probably 80%. I'd say probably 80% of Christians are, they're, they're either, they either don't know how to take ground or they're afraid to confront the enemy. And here's the thing. You, you are going to have to confront the enemy any way you look at it because he's not going to leave you alone. He's not just going to let you sit. You think if I can just, you know, hunker on down and, and keep my head down, then I, then I won't stir him up. But you just being a Christian stirs him up. And so if you do any, if you're going to be doing anything for the Lord, you need to learn how to fight. And you need to learn how to take ground. Yeah. And you know, I, before I got baptized, I got born again when I, in 1980, when I was just right around my 18th birthday. Um, but, you, but you wouldn't have known that I was born again at that time after I got, you know, probably two weeks I was, you know, I kind of walked the walk. But then after that I was, man, I was bad. I was bad, bad. So, but praise God, May 19th, 1993, I rededicated my life to the Lord and got baptized in the Holy Ghost and have been on fire ever since, right? But I'll say this, back, back in the day, we'll call it back in the day, before, before the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I would fight at the drop of a hat. I mean, you know, I, and I was kind of a smaller guy, you know, so I'd be always the one who they'd single out in a crowd, you know, if somebody was wanting to fight. So I learned some things in the natural and learn how to fight in the natural. And one of the things that did learn in the natural that that translate into the into the spiritual is when you're nose to nose with somebody and you know it's going to be a fight. You swing first. Seriously. I know you guys are thinking, you are so, you're a heaven. <laughs> it's just the way it is. I mean, you learn some things, right? You swing first because, especially if they're bigger than you, you want to make sure you get in the first blow so you can stagger them so you can continue to come at them, right? Well, it's the same thing in the supernatural. It's the same thing when you're fighting an enemy. It's the same thing when you're fighting an unseen enemy. You need to get the first blow in. Don't wait for him to hit you. You go after him. I want, how about you? Do you want the devil to say every morning when you get up, oh no, he's up again. I want the devil to just say under his breath, oh, why couldn't he just sleep in today? Right? I want him to be afraid of me. There's no reason for me to be afraid of him. Amen. So one of the things that you're going to need more than, than anything else is to be able to hear 
the voice of the Lord. Because you're going to need to get strategy. You're going to need to get battle plans. You're going to need to know when the enemy is coming against you. Because sometimes when the enemy comes, he can be very subtle. And it's not just overtly like, oh man, this is the devil. You know, the devil doesn't stand, the devil doesn't stand in front of you with a red pitchfork and say, hey, I'm the devil. I'm here to, to mess your day up. Right? He just doesn't do that. He's gonna get, he's gonna get somebody who will listen to him and will be influenced by him and, and put that person in your path in order to disrupt your day. So we need to be able to hear the voice of God. It's, it's, it's critical that you hear the voice of God in order to be able to understand what the enemy is trying to do to you. And there's a lot of different ways to hear the voice of God. Um, obviously, through the word is the primary way. But, but, you know, when the Lord speaks to people, when the Lord spoke, speaks to me, I don't hear an actual, like a sentence, like, you know, John, I want you to do this. I don't get that. I get like an impression, like I'm supposed to do something. And let's just be honest, even after 27 years of ministry, and, 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 and truly, I mean, 29 years of diligently, diligently seeking God. I, my, my fire today for the Lord is, is burning stronger than it was 29 years ago. Now, I have just as much zeal. I just have zeal with, that's tempered now. That's wisdom mixed with zeal. Early on, I didn't have wisdom mixed with zeal. It was just zeal. But now that I've gotten older, I've got wisdom mixed with zeal. And here's the thing. Even now, I'll be the first to admit it. I've missed the voice of the Lord. I mean, I'm trying to hear just like you all are trying to hear. And, and in this life that we live, in the life that we live, you know, there's, there's times when you're going to miss it. But you, you can't allow the enemy to bring condemnation to you and, 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 and allow him to keep you from trying again. So, so the, the way, and, 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 uh, and I'll say this, you know, one one voice of the Lord and you acting on it will propel you into the next phase of life that God has for you. I told you the story. Now, it took, it took the Lord a little bit to shake me up, you know, to get me to move in that direction. But I told you a story about why I, why I sold my businesses and merged my church. If I wouldn't have done those things if I'd have just been hard-headed like that and went to the hospital, came back from the hospital after the doctor told me all these terrible things that are wrong with me, and now I've got to overcome those and fe you know, with, overcome the fear that's associated with that. I mean, I could have easily just went back to my business and went back to, to being a pastor, and just everything would have stayed the same, and, and I wouldn't be in front of you right now. Do you understand what I'm saying? So one act of obedience can propel you into the next phase of your life. So let me tell you a story about how I got started in the ministry. So, um, so I, I, was, I was working for Northwest Airlines as an aircraft mechanic, and I used to drive 45 minutes to work. Well, on this drive to and from work, on this drive to work, there was a nursing home that sat up on a hillside uh, on my path where I drive, about, probably about 20, 30 minutes into my drive. And... As I'm, now I'm, a, I'm newly baptized in the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues every day, you know, loving the Lord, doing worship every day, just, just on fire, you know, in my personal life, right? And so I'm coming by there, and I just, I heard about, about a half a mile or a mile before I was coming to that nursing home, I heard in my heart, I want you to stop at that nursing home. And I was like, hmm, I wonder if that's the Lord. Boom, going by it, coming back home. I want you to stop by that nursing home. Boom, go on by. After, I went on for about a week. And I was like, Lord, I th that's you, Lord. Well, by the end of that week, well, because here's the deal. When I finally realized it was the Lord, I told the Lord, I'm not going to that nursing home. There's no way I'm going to that nursing home. You kidding me? You cr I, I, there's no way I'm going. To Lord, come on. Seriously, Lord, why would you make me do that? 
So he said, so it, it got to the point after about a week or, or so or that, midway through the second week, I'd, get, I'd be a mile away, mile and a half away, and tears would start to well up in my eyes. I'd start to cry a little bit. By the time I got, by the time I got parallel, perpendicular with that nursing home, I'd be in full-out bawling mode, just crying, because I knew, I knew the Lord was calling me, but I was afraid. I was afraid. Lord, what am I going to do when I go in there? He didn't give me a whole bunch of words like, I want you to talk to this person. Her, her name is Sally. You'll see her at the front desk. I want you, you know, I didn't have any of that. I just had, all I had was, I want you to go in that nursing home. And so finally, it got to the point. Finally, it got to the point after almost two weeks of bawling. I mean, I just literally would start to, I mean, I just, it, it was, I would be a, a basket case by the time I passed that nursing home. So finally, on the way home from work one day, I, uh, I just I settled it in my heart. I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to stop. Okay, Lord, I'm going to stop. You're almost shaking my fist. If you want me to go in there and be a fool of myself, I'll do it. I'll be a fool for Jesus. That's just fine. And so I, when I, I pulled into the nursing home parking lot, parked my, tri- my vehicle, and I reached behind me, and I grabbed, I had a red sweatshirt because one of the colors of Northwest Airlines was red. So I grabbed this red zip-up sweatshirt, and I put it on me and zipped it up. And let me tell you something. If you're trying to go in incognito into a place, red is not a good color to have on. <laughs> just saying, I stood out like a sore thumb. So, uh, which probably just adds to the story of how the Lord did it, right? So I put this red sweatshirt on, zipped it up, you know, so it would cover all my work emblems and that kind of stuff. So they wouldn't know that I worked for Northwest Airlines because if I got arrested or made a fool of myself... I don't want my company to be a part of it, right? So, um, so I walked in there, and I'm just like, I am literally afraid, full-out fear. Like, I don't know what to say, God. I don't know who I'm going to meet. And the Lord, honestly, was just silent. At that, in that, he was silent. So, and probably better, because if he'd have told me what was going to happen, I'd have probably messed it up. And so I walked in through the front, through the front door there, and there was a, that building was set up so it had like a, a major hub in the middle, and then it had like four spokes of, of rooms that went off, and this was where all the, in the middle was where all the offices, receptionary, and all that was. So I walked in, and when I walked in, there was a lady sitting right at the receptionist's desk, and I, I said, hey, how are you? She said, oh, I'm doing great. How are you? I said, great. And she just let me walk on by. I was like, praise the Lord, one down. Now I wonder what's going to happen. So I'm, I'm just, I'm walking down the, I'm walking down one of those, you know, legs of that, of rooms. And I'm just looking into the rooms and you know how you do, Lord, is there something that you're going to say to me? Lord, is there somebody? Show me, Lord. I mean, I'm literally begging the Lord to show me why I'm here. I'm like, Lord, show me. So I'm, well, finally I go to this room. I'm looking in the rooms, nothing's, nothing is triggering the voice of the Lord. And so I get to this one room, and, and they had, you know, they had handicap accessible doorways, so they were real wide. And so, uh, so I, I walked into that, walked in that room. There was a guy standing with a, an older guy standing with a, uh, with a walker there, and he was talking to another guy in the, in the room who was <clears throat> sitting in a chair. And they were standing there talking. I said, hey, how are you guys doing? They were cordial when I, when I said that. And I said, doing great. I says, hey. Let me ask you a question. Do you guys know Jesus? And when I said that, now I was about from here to Leslie away from the guy with the walker. That dude manifested a demon just like that. As soon as I said the name of Jesus, he started... Now this is an old guy in a walker, right? And he's about ready to rip that walker apart and beat me with it. And I'm like, yikes, wrong room. (laughs) I, I, literally, I literally ran out of the room. I was like, you know, I didn't know. I was a young Christian. I didn't know about casting out demons and all that kind of stuff. I just, I like hightailed it out of the room. I thought, man, I ain't going in that room. That's for sure. So I walked down the hall, left those guys alone. I walked down the hallway. As I'm walking down the hallway, there was this, uh, there was this guy in his room. He had a really nicely, may still remember what the bed looked like. He had a really beautifully made bed, like, you know, 
pristine corners. Obviously, he was military. Pristine corners. He had a nice cardigan sweater on. He was sitting on his bed looking out the window, just, you know, just really well made, right? And so I, I thought, all right, he looks harmless enough. I'm going to go in there and talk to that guy. <laughs> so I, I walked in and sat in a chair, put my back to the window, and just had a conversation with him. Well, as I'm having a really nice conversation with him, I see this lady, well-dressed lady, you know, rubber-soled shoes on, right? And she was walking down, and she, she got in line with that door, and she looked at me, and her and I kind of made eye contact. She walked by, she looked in the room, slowed way down. She, and I'm, she must have went three steps past that door, turned around and came back. And she walked right in the room. She said, sir, what are you doing here? I went, I, uh, um, uh, well, I, uh, well, you, you, uh, she said, would you come with, you know, but what are you going to say? The Lord told me to come in here. I mean, you could, I guess you could, and I would now, you know, and I'd have a little explanation behind it. But I thought, man, if I tell her the Lord told me to come in here, she's going to think I'm nuts. And so she said, will you come with me? And I thought, oh, darn it, now I'm going to jail. So I said, okay. So we started walking. Well, as we're walking, to, we walk out of the room. And as we're walking down the hallway, um, I thought to myself, well, if I'm in trouble, kind of like you do when you're a kid, no? If I'm in trouble, I'm going to really get in trouble. I'm going to just really get in trouble. So I said, so as we're walking down to back, you know, up the hallway, I says, ma'am, do you know Jesus? And she said, uh, 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 well, uh, 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 now, now the uh, uh, uhs are coming from the other side, right? She said, well, I go to church. I said, well, that's great that you go to church. I says, but do you have a personal relationship? So I just started to put the full, full court press on her, right, on getting born again. Well, she, we went into her office, and we got into a really nice conversation. And after that conversation, she took one of her cards off of her whole card holder, slid it across the table and said, would you like to hold Bible studies here at our facility? I said, absolutely I would like to. It, yeah, absolutely. So I, so I walked out. I was so excited. I went back to the, to the nursing home slash jail ministry head that we had at the church, told him, and he put me on the rotation for all of the nursing homes. And so my wife and I, we would go into the nursing homes, and, and she'd play the piano, and, and I'd sing, and the kids would, you know, be my sound man, my sound team, and, you know, all that. And, and, and the whole thing is, if I wouldn't have done that one act of obedience... I wouldn't be standing here before you today. We think that these little things don't make a difference, but I'm telling you, they do. You don't know how much every one of these small little decisions that you think are insignificant really carry a lot of weight. So Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, let's, let's read that. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, For we do not, this is a pretty familiar verse probably to most of you, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Yo, listen, we, you are fighting against an enemy that you cannot see. And have you, let me ask you a question, have you ever been around somebody, maybe even, somebody that you know well, Christians even, Christians. And, and it's like suddenly they just do something so stupid or they attack you out of just like, like why are they attacking? You, you don't understand what I'm saying? You know what that is? That's spiritual warfare. That's a battle. They're, they're listening to the enemy. We have to learn how not to react to that in the flesh. We have to learn, how, and, and listen, if we can just be honest, let's just be honest. Leslie and I don't, we don't, we don't really argue much. Occasionally we do, but we don't really argue much. But there has been times when we have. We've had some heated, passionate discussions, if you understand what I'm saying. And how many of you know, you'll be in that heated, passionate discussion, and you'll hear this voice inside your head. You, you know the words. There have been some words suggested to you in your mind that you know, if I say these, I will win this, this argument. 
I will win this battle. I will win this war. But then there's that other voice inside of you that says, John, don't say it. John, don't say it. And you're like, you man, you're forming that thing up. You are getting ready. You, I know exactly what to say. You're forming that thing up. And, and the Lord is going, John, don't do it. Don't you, don't say, and it's getting louder. How many of you know what I'm saying? It's getting louder and louder inside of your head. For He's telling you not, but your flesh and the influence of that spirit. And what do you do? You try not to say it, but let's just be honest. We end up saying it sometimes. You have just submitted. That doesn't mean that you're demon-possessed. That doesn't mean that you're, you're taken up. That just means you submitted to the flesh or the enemy's voice. And how many of you know you create damage that sometimes can't be fixed or at least can't be fixed overnight? Right? And so, so we need to learn how all of these little things that, we're, that we are being, that is coming against us are an unseen em enemy that is trying to take you out. And so I've, I've, I've found three different things that I would call offensive weapons for us to take ground. So three offensive weapons. Now, this is not, this is not an exclusive list. This is not the only list. But these are the three that I know over the course of 27 years, 29 years really of, of this life, of walking this out, that have been effective in my walk and have keeping me in the game, Leslie and I, in the game today. So I just, I, I, I want to talk about some of the offensive weapons, but I'm going to focus in on three. Now, there, there's, there's all sorts of offensive weapons, guys, in the Christian walk. And for instance, Jesus said in, in Luke chapter 21, verse 19, by your patience, possess your soul. I don't know if you realize this or not, but patience can be an offensive weapon. Patience can be an offensive weapon. You know, like the Lord will tell you to, to or, 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 you, or you have an, an idea that you want to do something and you just say, you know what? I'm just going to wait and see if this is the Lord. Or if the Lord tells you to do something, you just take some time and be patient. The Lord's not in a hurry like you and I are. Sometimes he'll say, I need you to do this now, but that's not very often. Another one is peace. Did you know, you, we know Jesus spoke peace over situations, right? Peace be still. Walking in peace and, and speaking peace over people's lives is an offensive weapon. Because the devil knows he's not got you rattled. So that's an offensive weapon. Um, the prayer of agreement is also a great way to take ground and, and to get on offense. And then, and these I'm not talking about, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get too far into it. Your actions are a huge offensive weapon. Let me tell you a story. So when I was, when I was, um, it, it, it was before, it was before, just probably the year before I came out here to Bible school, actually. So in like 1998, I was in a men's group and we were playing, um, we were playing volleyball at this men's group on a Saturday afternoon. And me and another guy, both of us, uh, he was on the opposing team. We went up for a spike and we, we got our legs tangled up in the, in the air and his weight and my weight both came down on my feet and my ankles folded. And I think they both were broken, but they folded and it was immediate pain. I mean, the moment I hit, I just crumpled and laid on the ground. And I was just breathing in pain. I was rolling around on the ground. Just in, it hurt. It, it, I mean, it was, I've been hurt a lot. And that hurt probably one of the, the worst things that's ever hurt. And um, I'm rolling around on the ground. And these guys are all standing. <laughs> this is a bunch of Christians, right? Spirit-filled Christian ton talkers. They're all standing around watching me. <laughs> you know, nobody's praying. Nobody's, nobody's, you know, speaking life over me. They're just... I'm laying there on the ground rolling around for two or three, you know, for a minute or so. And I said, dudes, can one of you guys pray, man? Come on. So then they all got down on their knee, you know, and started laying hands on me and pray for me. Well, I didn't, I didn't get, I, I was still in bad shape. 
I couldn't walk. And so I just told my, my I, I came with a buddy of mine. I said, just drive me home, man. Just take me home. I just need to get home. So just get me home. So he said, okay, sure. You don't want to go to the hospital? I said, no, I'm not going to the hospital. Just take me home. So he, you know, he, he, he got me out to the car. Him, him and the other guys kind of carried me out to the car and got me in his truck. But I was, you know, he wasn't much bigger than me, and he couldn't carry me from that truck into my house. So I, I swung myself out of that truck. I couldn't touch my feet to the ground because my ankles were, and they, blew, they were huge by that time. They were blown up like two purple balloons. And so I couldn't walk, and I couldn't even touch my toes to the ground. So I crawled when, I, when we got to my driveway, and he couldn't pick me up. I swung my feet out and underneath the truck so they wouldn't touch the ground. And I put my points and my knees on the ground. And I crawled because I couldn't touch my toes to the ground, even in a crawl, because it would just send pain, you know, shuddering up through my body. So Leslie meets me at the door. What happened to him? Oh, he twisted his ankles. Okay, so I, I crawling on the points of my knees, I crawled into my house and got up, slung myself up on the couch. Leslie brought me down some, some, you know, some comfortable clothes, and I changed into those best I could through tears. Um, and so this was on a Saturday. And so I'm up on the couch, and I just stayed on the couch. I didn't get off the couch. I couldn't. I couldn't walk, couldn't do anything. I have, if I had to go to the bathroom, I'd crawl. We had to go up one short flight of steps to go to the bathroom. I'd crawl up, not letting my toes touch the ground to go to the bathroom, come back down. So Sunday morning comes, and Leslie gets herself ready for church. She says, I'm taking the kids to church. I said, honey, yeah, you go. You go to church. So she went off to church. I had my feet. My, my legs were hanging over the arm of the, of the, chair, of the couch. Um, and so I'm sitting there. I had the remote control, and I, I put on, well, if, I'm, if I can't go to church, I'm going to watch church on TV, right? So I pull up Kenneth Copeland, and I'm watching Kenneth Copeland. And he's preaching a strong faith message, and in my heart, I heard a healed man wouldn't be on the, on the couch on a Sunday morning when his family's at church. You're confessing that you're healed. A healed man wouldn't be on the couch on Sunday morning while his wife and kids are at church. I said, Lord, is that you? <laughs> he said it again. I said, okay. That's you. So I swung myself off that couch. I crawled upstairs. I got dressed as best as I could, combed my hair, crawled myself, crawled back down, got to the, to the door, to the garage where my vehicle was, and it was like, it was like um, I can't crawl into my truck. I mean, I'm going to have to stand. So... I brought myself to my feet, and I'm standing. And I, I, I mean, like, I, sh I literally was walking like this. Just little, I mean, it just hurt, it hurt so bad. And so I, I walked myself out to the garage. I got in my truck, and I had a Ford Ranger with a really stiff clutch. Yes, with a really stiff clutch. And church was about six or seven miles away, most of it through neighborhood. And so I, was, I got myself in that truck, and I literally pushed down on that clutch, tears streaming down my face, put it into reverse, backed it out, put it into first gear, tears streaming down my face the whole time. I, was, not, 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 I wasn't crying. The pain was so bad that it just, tears just ran. If, you've ever, if you know enough, if you've ever been, felt extreme pain. Just running down my, my, my ankles had to be broken. Tears running down, and, and just a little side note, I put these old tennis shoes on that I had in the garage that I cut the grass with and all that kind of stuff, because they were the only ones that I couldn't, I, that, that I didn't need to put laces on, like they were real wide, you know, and I could get my foot in there, because my feet were so swelled up. So I drove to church through that neighborhood, finally got the last mile and a half, I was out on the, on the highway, and I'm, I could put it into fifth gear and just Take, you know, take some deep breaths because it hurt, you know what I mean? Pulled into church, went like this. Message, the worship was just finishing up. Pastor, I got up to preach. I shuffled my way in, sat in the back, back row. And just, we do just like they do here. Um, they do a ministry line at the end. 
So they called up, the you know, pastor preached his message. They, they called the ministers up. One of the elders who happened to be at that men's meeting, him and, his, him and his wife saw me in the back. They came back. They laid hands on me and prayed for me. I shuffled my way back out of the church before everybody else was done because I didn't want to get hit with the crowd. Got back in my truck. But you know what? When I got back in my truck, the pain wasn't nearly as bad. And so I went back home, and I was sitting on the couch instead of laying on the couch. And I worked as an aircraft mechanic on my feet for 8, 10, 12 hours a day. You didn't sit down as an aircraft mechanic. You're on your feet. I took Monday off to get a little more healing manifested. Tuesday, I was back at work. So the whole point of that story is your actions are spiritual warfare. When you resist a temptation, when you resist uh, 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 saying something, when you resist things that are going to draw you out or that are contrary to the Word of God, just like that word that I heard in my heart, a healed man doesn't lay on the couch saying he's sick when his wife and his children are at church on a Sunday morning. So if I'm saying that I'm healed, your actions, now that's not what I'm teaching on, um, your actions make a huge difference. Your actions make a huge difference in spiritual warfare. Okay, let's talk about the first one, the Word of God. So Word of God, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 says this. Um, if you could bring that up for me, guys. So we're talking about the, all, all of the other armor of God in this passage, if you're familiar with it. All of the other armor of God is all defensive armor. The, the, the shield of faith, the, the breastplate of light righteousness, the helmet of salvation, all of those are defensive armor weapons or defensive armor the sword of the spirit and praying in the spirit are your two offensive weapons that are that are described here and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god now how many of you know a sword can be used as a defensive weapon or it can be used as an offensive weapon too many times the only thing we do with the Word of God is we use it as a defensive weapon. But I'm telling you, it is one effective way to take ground is by the Word of God. And how you do that is you need to, you need to find the promise of God for your situation, what you're believing God for, and use it offensively proactively rather than waiting for the most Christians just wait for a crisis to hit and then once a crisis hits then they begin to pull out the promises of God and begin to attack the sit the crisis with it but I'm saying if you see yourself in the future wealthy you need to start speaking scriptures that talk about you being wealthy if you if you see yourself walking in perfect health in the future, you need to speak the word of God over. For instance, let me, let me just give you a couple of prayers. Prayers that I pray regularly. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, that the same spirit that raised, raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. And if that spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he shall quicken your mortal body. Right? So the way I take, I take that scripture, using it as the word of God, as an offensive weapon. Father, I thank you that your spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me. And because he dwells in me, my body is being quickened right now. My body is in full health, and I am walking in the freedom of the Lord. I thank you, Father, that no sickness can touch me. It has no right to me. Because your spirit dwells in me, and he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Therefore, no sickness can... You understand what I'm saying? So don't wait for the crisis to hit you be proactive now and you won't have to fight a crisis most of the time if we just begin to take ground like like before a crisis you'll fight far less battles by being aggressive with your faith and being aggressive to declare the promises of God over top to you over top of you can I get an amen to that amen. and your words um, your words Woven together with the word of God are powerful offense. And in, in Ephesians, I'm sorry, in 1 Timothy 1.18, here's another part of the word of God. You know, the Bible says God does nothing upon the earth without re revealing it first to his servants, the prophets. 
God does nothing upon the earth without revealing it first to his servants, the prophets. So if you, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, it's the apostle Paul told his spiritual son, Timothy, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Did you know those prophetic words that have been spoken over you in the past, those encouraging words that you know were from God that have been spoken over you in the past, you need to use those as offensive weapons to defeat the enemy. My wife and I, back when we first moved back to Pennsylvania, um, we, we, we sat in front of, we were at a, at a local church there, and they invited in a prophetic presbytery, they called it. So it was like these three, three prophetic guys that they, it was a platform very similar to this, maybe a little bit higher. They put th these three prophetic guys on one side of the platform, and then they invited up, like, first the leadership and then other people, and Leslie and I were elders at the time. They invited up myself and Leslie and our three kids. And we all sat on the other stage and these three guys, prophetic guys, would get up and then they would just prophesy over you. And so, so one of the guys, um, was his first name Joe, Joe Kramer? Joe Kramer. Joe Kramer prophesied this big, long prophecy over us. And they were all, all these prophecies were recorded, okay? And so Leslie, you know, she, she, she was an administrative assistant for a number of years, and she had one of those things where you could put the tape in, in the foot thing, and then she had the ears, and she'd run the tape and type it up, right? So she typed up all of those prophecies that were ever spoken. I got a stack of prophecies that she's typed up for me that are that big in that, that, I, that I have in a drawer. That prophecy that was spoken over 20 years ago, and there were some very specific words that came forth under those prophecies, very specific. I've used those over the years and fought the good fight of faith. I have declared those promises over us. And now, 20 years later, you know, some stuff, this takes time. 20 years later, you can scratch off with a pen every one that has been fulfilled. There's only one that's left that has not been fulfilled. And there was probably five, four or five, six of them maybe in there. Specific words. Those wouldn't have come to pass if I wouldn't have used those, just like the, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, to wage the good warfare by the, previous, the, the, the prophecies that were previously spoken over you. you need to, if you get a prophetic word spoken over you, not only do you need to believe it, but you need to declare it over you. Amen. And I'm, we've, we've almost got there. I think we've tasted a little bit of it. The last one that's left is you'll be getting stuff pennies on the dollar. Penny, I'm, hey, amen. You want to believe for that? That's what I'm believing for. Thank you, Lord. How do you pray that out? Thank you, Lord, that we're receiving stuff, pennies on the dollar. Father, I thank you for that. I, th I thank you that, God, you, the word of the prophet is true. And I believe the prophets. The Lord says in 2 Chronicles 20, 20, believe in the Lord thy God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. You want to prosper in this life? Use the prophetic word of the Lord. Oh, I did it again, didn't I, Jeremy? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I say it, I did it again because I, I run short every time, run short of time. I'm an hour preacher. I'm an hour and a half preacher. I'm not a 50-minute preacher. Okay, pray. I'm, I'm going to do two, I'm gonna do two more um, real quickly. Praise is a powerful weapon when you're fighting against the enemy. And praying in tongues. I just want to do a couple of things. First, I want to do a story about praise. Uh, we, they heard it in the first service. So I was working uh, concerning praise as a weapon because you don't realize how important praise is as a weapon. I mean, when, you're, when your mind, particularly you, those of you who might be dealing with fear, who, who have a, that get attacks of fear often, or you have a mind that likes to race and think about too much, I'm telling you a good worship session can get you delivered. And you don't have to be here at church to do a worship session. You can be home alone, just worship the Lord, and it will quiet the, 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 the enemy who's trying to, to deceive you, trying to get you. You know, I, we play, if you come to our house, pretty much worship music is playing in the background all the time. Like, especially when it comes right around dinner time, I get home from work, Leslie will usually have um, 
you know, worship music playing, and we'll just play it through the rest of the night until we're about ready to go to bed. We just keep it going in the background. It's just, it's just there silencing the enemy. So I, I was, this was my first business that I had when I started here at, uh, 20 years ago in uh, hardwood flooring business when I was going to school, Bible school, and I was putting, we were up on the side of Pikes Peak at working on a custom house, and I was putting together, putting together a custom set of steps. And um, so I, I, was, I was holding, we, we used these nail guns, pneumatic nail guns, that shot a two-inch nail, two inches long, and it's about the thickness of, a, let's say, of a bobby pin, okay? So it was a pin nail, thick, two inches long, thickness of a bobby pin. So I had my hand holding together the corner of a, of a set of stairs, and, I, and I'm firing a nail to get the two pieces to hold together. When I fired that nail, that nail blasted through that wood, and it went right down my thumb. All two inches of it st- is in my thumb. And it's only, I'm not kidding you, it was just the tip of that nail was sticking out of my thumb. Teeny little bit of that nail. And I'm like, owie, 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 owie. Ah, ah, ah. So I'm walking around with my, my thumb like this, right? And I go to the guy who's working with me. Now, this guy, was a, I was a first-year Bible college student when that happened. This guy was a second-year Bible college student. All right? And so and he worked for me. And I said, I said, pull it out, man, pull it out. And he said, you know, he didn't know because he didn't know what had happened. I said, pull it out, man, pull it out. And you couldn't hardly see it because it was just a little tip of it sticking out of the end of my thumb. I said, pull it out, man, pull it out. He said, what are you talking about? I said, dude, look at the nail sticking out of my thumb, please. Just pull it out. And he, he says, okay. So he runs with a toolbox. He grabs a, a pair of pliers. He said, you ready? I said, yeah, go. And he went, thump, and he pulled that thing out. Big old bloody nail. And I went, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, I love you so much. Thank you, you've healed my thumb. Oh, thank you that I'm pain-free, Lord. I just, I worship for about 10 minutes, maybe longer, just walking around on that, you know, floor we're installing, just praising God, walking around the house, telling him how much I loved him, how, how, you know, how awesome he is, and that you're my healer, Lord. And after about 10 minutes of that, I said, all right, let's go back to work, dude. So we, we both went back to work. Now, this is the second-year Bible college student, my first-year Bible college student. After about 10 minutes, it was quiet, dead silent. He's working, I'm working. He says to me, dude, you handled that a lot different than I would have. <laughs> right? I just learned, though, how important praise is for silencing the enemy. And don't you know I was attacked? Yeah, amen. Don't you know I was attacked with fear? Man, what about tetanus? You're going to get tetanus. You know, you better go get a shot. You better go to the hospital. Make sure you didn't shatter your bone in there. You know, all of these things, right? And i got to deal with the pain because there's still a little bit of residual pain left, right? i got to deal with all of that. But you've got to fight that stuff in your mind, and that's when you need to just use praise or the Word of God in order to be victorious over it. Amen? Amen. Yeah, amen. All right, my last thing. I'm just going to... My last thing. Praying in the Spirit, y'all. Praying in the Spirit is the key to the Christian walk. It's the key. And, you know, the Bible says in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 1, that though I pray with the tongue of men and angels... And have not love. Men and angels. You pray in the... Let me ask you a question. Why would you pray in the tongue of angels? Why would you, why would you even need to bother to pray in the tongue of angels? Because here's what I believe. This is my own theology. This is, this is, this is just what I... Th- from nuances in the scripture. The Bible says that the angels are reapers. The Bible clearly says that in, in Matthew 13, that the angels are the reapers. That, and in, in that story, it's reaping souls at the end of the age. But if the angels are reapers, that, that's their job. Let me ask you a question. When you pray in the spirit, in the tongue of an angel, are you dispatching angels on your behalf? or is Because remember, remember, the Holy Spirit is praying through you. So it's the Holy Spirit praying. Through your spirit. It's the Holy Spirit praying. So it's one part of the Godhead praying. It's one part of the Godhead praying through you. 
So is he dispatching angels on your behalf since you're praying in the tongue of an angel? Is he dispatching angels on your behalf to what? Bring in the harvest, the reapers, to bring the harvest to you. I'm just, you know, sometimes you got to use your head for something more than a hat rack, right? You got to use it to be think. You got to use it to think and, and put some connect, connect some dots. You know, the Bible says that we each have an, an angel who beholds the face of the Lord continually. You know, Kenneth, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this. Um, Kenneth, Kenneth Hagin talks about a story where uh, most of you, do you know who Kenneth Hagin is? Just let me see a few hands. Okay. So Kenneth Hagin is an old time preacher. He preached during the, he taught during the 30s and the 40s and the 50s into the 70s and 80s. Um, and he talks about a story where the Lord Jesus appeared to him. Okay. And when the Lord Jesus appeared to him, he, he Jesus appeared to him with an angel. And, and now don't, don't, don't think that it's weird that Jesus would appear to somebody because Jesus appeared to the disciples after he rose from the dead, right? Remember he told Thomas, you know, handle me, feel my hands and my feet, right? Feel my side, feel my hands, handle me. So th th don't seem that that would be unusual. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Jesus appeared to Kenneth Hagin and started to talk to him about some things. And so Kenneth Hagin said, as he was looking at Jesus and there was this big guy standing behind him. And so he'd look up at this, he'd you know, shift his eyes off of Jesus' eyes and look up to this big guy who was standing behind Jesus. And, and he, said, um, he said, every time he'd look at him, this, this angel would begin to open his mouth. And then Kenneth Hagin would look back at Jesus. So this went on for two or three times. And finally, Kenneth Hagin said, Lord, who's that big fellow in there behind you? He said, well, he's your angel. And he's got something to tell you. So then Kenneth Hagin fixed his eyes up on that angel. And the angel told him about some stuff that was to come and some people that were in his ministry that he needed to stay away from that were going to try to deceive him and just some different things. Now, the question is this. And I believe that story. But why didn't the Lord tell him that? Why did he need to have an angel tell him that? He was talking with the Lord. Why couldn't the Lord just have said that? Because, the Lord, because these angels have specific duties and they are assigned to specific people. And when you pray in the Spirit, you are dis I believe you are dispatching angels on your behalf to advance the kingdom in your life and in the life of those around you. I'm just telling you, I'm telling you, there is, there is more to it. Speaking mysteries, Bible talks in 1 Corinthians 14 too, that he who, who, who prays in an unknown tongue speaks mysteries. You don't know what the future, your future looks like, but God does. And you, I believe you pray out your future when you pray in the Spirit. You pave the path for you to walk. You pave the path for you to walk by praying in the Spirit. Spirit. I just can't emphasize enough how important it is for you to pray in the Spirit. I believe the more you pray in the Spirit, the more you, let's just say it like it is, the more you pray in tongues, the, the less physical battle you will have to do against the enemy. The more you pray in tongues, the less warfare you will have to do up here. You won't have to battle as much up here. The Bible says, he who prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself. He who prays in a... And that word edified means to build a house to promote growth in wisdom. Edify means to promote growth in wisdom. When you pray in the Spirit... You know what? You may be one nugget of wisdom away from a million dollars. You may be one nugget of wisdom away from avoiding a tragedy. One nugget of wisdom. The Bible says praying in tongues edifies you, which is promotes wisdom. I hope I've stirred you up to to be praying in tongues, to be praising God, and to be digging into your Bible. Because I can tell you, we can tell you, 
through experience. This stuff works. Amen? Let me pray for you real quick. Father, thank you uh, for my family here at River Rock Church and just what a blessing they are, Father. Thank you for your word. That, Father, your word is powerful. It's living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, help us to recognize that we are in a spiritual battle. Help us, Father, to wage warfare with your word, by praise and with the Spirit. Father, thank you for the victory that you have given us in Jesus. Thank you for your grace that is just amazing, Lord, that you have been so good to us. We give you praise for that, Lord. Lord, I just pray every person here who is in this room that that your word declares, Lord, that my sheep know my voice and they will not follow another. I thank you that they know your voice, that the people that are listening online or to the recording, that they know your voice because they are your sheep and your sheep know your voice. Lord, help us to be bold, to be obedient with boldness to what you have called us to do. We thank you and we love you, Lord, and thank you for this opportunity to impart wisdom and understanding to your people. In Jesus' name.